tonight fatal injection, the hospital blunder that killed Wayne Giles. An exclusive interview with his parents. Before he died, he just wasn't responding to anything. We just knew that there was no way back for him. How could it happen? What must be done? One tragedy of this nature, particularly when it can be so easily corrected, is absolutely unforgivable. Also tonight, the crime that shook Britain. That was Liz. She, she wouldn't give up. She wouldn't want people like that to get away with it. And the dangers of having a go. And it could quite easily have been me. I just didn't think about what I was doing. I just went over and tackled him. I just did it. Plus, look who is talking. Filth. And this is the first time I've ever been able to say my own name. But will the transformation last? You've always got to think of yourself as a recovering stammerer. The stories that matter to you. Tonight with Trevor MacDonald. He beat cancer but died at the hands of his doctors. Why the blunder that killed Wayne Jowett must never be repeated. Good evening. The story of Wayne Jowett is heartbreaking. At a hospital with a fine reputation, a young man recovering from cancer was given the wrong spinal injection. The damage was irreversible, and Wayne spent his last days knowing that he'd beaten leukemia, but was condemned to die because of what the coroner described today as a catalogue of errors. Today's inquest into Wayne's death said he was the victim of a terrible accident. But the question remains, how could it happen? Tonight, for the first time, Wayne's parents feel able to talk about their very personal tragedy, about the incredible bravery of their son, and their own campaign now to try to prevent anything like it happening again. They've been talking exclusively to Fiona Foster. This is the story of a boy robbed of his future, a family grieving for the loss of a son, and a health service which fails to learn from its mistakes. He was very loving, always wanting to get everything done. He wanted to uh, achieve a lot of things. Um, I think it was too much of a challenge. He was just a caring, loving person. He was always uh, very aggressive in things what he'd done. He always gave them 110%. You know, if he played football or rugby or drove his stock car, he'd always give it his best shot, you know, whether he was good at the thing what he was doing or, you know, if he wants a good. Wayne's passion for cars was more than just a hobby. When he wasn't on the racetrack, he worked in a garage in Nottingham and was looking forward to passing his exams and qualifying as a lorry mechanic. Then, two years ago, he was diagnosed with leukaemia. He just was so tired all the time and we thought that he was um, a typical teenager, you know, until it got to a stage where he literally could not get out of bed. He couldn't lift his head. He was so ill. He was so sick. In the end, we had to have the doctor out to him. And he did some blood tests. And I took them into the hospital that on the Monday, I think it was. And um, he was in the hospital within a few hours. And that was, that was it. The next day, he was diagnosed with uh, lymphoblastic leukaemia. What was Wayne's reaction to his diagnosis? He, uh, he was devastated at first, really devastated. Broke down crying and thinking, you know, we comforted him and we said, well, you know, they can treat you and we will get you better and we're going to think positive. And, uh, and that's what we've done. He picked his son up fast, you know, very fast. He pulled himself together. He put a brave face on it, but it was difficult to hide the pain caused by the chemotherapy. Wayne's treatment involved two injections, one directly into his spine, the other, a powerful anti-cancer drug called vincristine, was injected into a vein. How did 
the leukemia affect Wayne's lifestyle, how he lived his life? Well, it com completely I mean, changed, didn't it? Yeah. Yet. On the uh, first uh, three months of leukemia, the treatment was quite intense. So I was in and out of hospital virtually all the time. So this cake goes out to Wayne then. It's uh, best wishes from all his friends and family, everyone who's rooted together tonight. Thanks to the early discovery of his cancer and the support of his family and friends, Wayne's treatment proved effective. And towards the end of last year, it seemed he was well on his way to beating the disease. He was planning on starting back to work um, end of April, June time. Uh, he'd made so many plans he wanted to do. He was getting stronger. Um, and he knew he was just about over everything. We'd got, got through. On the 4th of January, Wayne came here to the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. As the new year began, his leukaemia was in remission and he had every reason to look forward to the future. But what should have been a routine treatment visit turned into a tragic series of mistakes that would cost Wayne his life. He was uh, supposed to go into hospital in the morning, but Wayne's always been apprehensive about these lumbar punctures and they are... They frightened him. He didn't like them and they're not pleasant, uh, not for anybody. And uh, it took him a few days to get the courage up always to go in for them. Do you mind coming up right to the side of the bed? Really up. What happened next is a catalogue of blunders and incompetence that is hard to believe. Under the supervision of Dr. Fida Mulhem, a hospital registrar, Dr. David Morton, a senior house officer who'd given only one spinal injection before, administered Wayne's chemotherapy. The treatment involved two injections. To prevent mistakes, the drugs were always injected on different days and never sent to the ward together. On this occasion, both drugs arrived on the same day at the same time. Even so, warning labels on the vincristine clearly stated that the drug was not for spinal injection. But the labelling failed to stop the doctors, and Dr Morton injected vincristine, a lethal neurotoxic drug, into Wayne's spine. This drug, vincristine, has got to be given into a blood vessel because if uh, it is, misses the blood vessel, if the doctor or nurse misses the blood vessel and it goes into the tissue round about it, it will be, have the same effect as injecting sulfuric acid. As soon as the doctors realised their mistake, Wayne was rushed into surgery. All staff could do was try to flush the chemical out of Wayne's spine because this lethal drug has no known antidote. As soon as we arrived at the hospital, we had two doctors uh, come to tell us that uh, there'd been a mistake, they'd injected a drug into his spine, which they shouldn't have done, and it was fatal, and they needed to try and get this drug out. And, you know, he was there for about 48 hours, wasn't he? And they couldn't uh, sedate him, because they needed to assess... The damage. His ...progress, his damage. They could only give him painkillers, which didn't really work. Very well, did they? Sometimes there was like six nurses and they were still around the bed. Holding him? Holding him down. Because uh, he was in that much pain, you know. And, and most of it was cramped, wasn't it? Yeah, his, his body would go into spasm and it was very, very uncomfortable. Did Wayne realise at that time what had been he, done? Yes, he knew that they'd put the wrong drug in as soon as they realised. So they um, told him immediately? Yes, they had to. Yeah. He didn't actually know quite how fatal it was. He didn't know that. Uh, they told us, you know, that he would probably die. Die from it. Was Wayne conscious during... I mean, were you talking to him every day? Was he capable of that? He was conscious for about a fortnight. Yeah. And then he slowly... Um, deteriorated where he couldn't move his body and he couldn't speak and the only way he could communicate was with a few facial expressions but even that deteriorated and but by this time he was put on a life support machine because his lungs he couldn't breathe on his own. At what stage did you realise that this was in fact irreversible? 
and that Wayne wasn't it going to make would it. would be a few days before he died. He, he just wasn't responding to anything. It was on January the uh, <coughs> 30th, 29th, 30th. 29th, yeah. And uh, we just knew that, you know, there was no way back for him. You know, you, you, you're not supposed to watch your son die, you know. It should be the other way around, you know. And you had to make the decision to stop treatment at that stage? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the actual thing is the treatment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> As the Jowetts struggle to understand their son's death, it might be of some comfort to think that this is a one-off, an appalling series of mistakes that couldn't happen again. But this isn't the first time, far from it. Wayne is at least the 11th person since 1985 to die this way. And yet, a foolproof device which could have prevented his death does exist. The problem is, the health service doesn't use it. This would be a, a drug which was meant to go into the bloodstream, uh, such as vincristine, in a, the appropriate syringe, and when you try to introduce it, it cannot go in. The syringe nozzle won't fit, and more importantly, the valve in the hub is activated and doesn't allow any fluid to go through. It's difficult to know how many spinal injections are given per year, perhaps about 30,000 for chemotherapy, obviously a lot more for anesthesia. But really one tragedy of this nature, particularly when it can be so easily corrected, is absolutely unforgivable. Clearly the technology is available and Dr. Peters says his device would be cheap and easy to make. But the medical industry has been slow to recognise the problem. And until the government puts pressure on them to do so, there's no reason to believe that Wayne's death will be the last. As far as you're concerned, who is to blame for Wayne's death? I blame the doctors uh, because the doctors should take responsibility for what they're doing. There was just total negligence. He wasn't concentrating on what they was doing. And uh, whatever procedures they had in line before that made no odds what those two doctors done was unforgivable. So the drug that should have been injected into the back and the vincristine should not have been in the same room that, at that, the same that, time. That, 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 was, that was one of the things, one of the things that, that, that uh, went wrong. But as I said, there were other issues. There were issues about the training that was provided to people. Should the doctor administering the vincristine have known that it was lethal if injected into the spine? Well, I don't want to get into what individuals should and shouldn't have done, but I, I do think that we do need to look at the training that is provided, both in terms of when doctors start in a particular hospital, but also the wider medical training that's provided. The Jowetts are very keen to see some kind of foolproof device to make sure that human error is taken out of the equation so that Vin Christine can't physically be injected into the spine. Do you think that is the way forward? I think that's one element, and I think it's, it's, it's an important element. But I don't think our responsibilities end there. I think there are other ways we can minimise the, the chance of an error happening, and, and we have a responsibility of that in, in, in this hospital, as do other hospitals. But clearly, if there was a, a full, uh, an error-proof um, design, then that would be a very welcome development. But, but as I said, I don't think our responsibilities end there. Every year, more than 15,000 spinal injections are carried out in Britain. Wayne and Stella Jowett know that a simple design change could have prevented the death of their son. They believe that action must be taken now before someone else dies an agonising and needless death. People need to know that these mistakes can happen, and, but there are procedures that can stop it and it needs, it needs to be brought to light. It can't happen to any more families. How important is it f for you and, and for Wayne's memory that the lessons are learnt from his death and that something is done? 
provide a, a fail safe. Very important. Yeah, we've lost a lovely, lovely person. The family has, the whole family and his friends, and it shouldn't have happened. And I don't want, I don't want him to be forgotten. And he's, he'd want something doing. He would want something doing. Say, enough's enough. Parents of Wayne Jarrett talking to Fiona Foster. Following today's inquest, a spokesman for the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham issued a further apology for Wayne's death. He said that the staff at the hospital were devastated by what had happened and vowed that they would do everything in their power to stop a similar tragedy happening again. And there is a telephone number for anyone wishing to support the Jarrett campaign. It is 0115 -901 It was a crime that shocked us all. Liz Sherlock died because she gave chase to thieves. Coming next, how one woman's courage has highlighted a crime epidemic. I think it's an awful reflection of our times. You know, this, the, the, this sort of thing should happen. I can't believe in this day and age uh, that this sort of crime could take place. That's in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. The senseless and violent death of Liz Sherlock has shocked the nation. One minute she was enjoying a cup of coffee with her husband, waiting for a train at Euston Station. The next, she was dead, run over, trying to stop thieves driving off with her handbag. It was a crime which made everyone aware of how vulnerable we all are to an epidemic of mugging and theft, and to the dangers of having a go. Michael Nicholson reports. Euston Station. A bag snatch. So quick. So easy. And so, so common. But on Monday last, it was different. Tragically, outrageously different. A bag stolen and a woman killed. Well, it doesn't surprise any of us to see such a heavy police presence on the station now. Police who are constantly reminding us not to have a go. But when Liz Sherlock had a handbag snatched from her while she was drinking coffee in this restaurant, she did have a go because there was nobody, and none of these police anyway here present, to have a go on her behalf. She chased the thieves out of the station, jumped onto the bonnet of their car, and held on to it until they turned the corner and she came off and was run over. She had a go, it cost her her life and the 20 pounds in her handbag. They were sitting having coffee, the bag was around her, probably down by her feet. Um, Liz looked down and noticed that the bag had gone and quickly looked around and targeted somebody she believed was the perpetrator. As it so happens, it turned out it obviously was right um, from subsequent events, and she gave chase. A couple of firemen came out and saw her actually getting run over. One of the firemen tried to stop the car by throwing its helmet at the windscreen. The two muggers abandoned their car nearby. There was no doubting it. A cracked windscreen, bent wipers. They kept the 20 pounds. She was a have-a-go person. She wouldn't want people like that to get away with it. Um, and it's, it's such, a, such a tragedy, you know, for the people that know her. But we knew what type of person she was. She wasn't going to let them get away with it. To know her, work with her, and to see what happened, you can see that if she was in a situation like that, she would not be one of them people who would walk away. And I mean, she would be there and fight for her rights, and she had a right. No one's got a right to nick anyone's handbag or disturb anyone's space. Some eight years ago, Liz was working in Rome and had her bag taken by a group of gypsies. And Liz had a colleague with her and they gave chase. And the colleague's use of some colourful Italian language 
um, must have shocked the gypsies, who handed all Liz's stuff back to her. Liz Sherlock was a costume designer who'd worked on many top TV programmes, including the BBC's Crime Watch. She also worked on Channel 5's It's a Knockout. Liz actually worked on 26 One Hours and It's a Knockout, and it was her first big design job. It was her responsibility. Nobody there. It was her job. And we'd present her with tasks, you know, can you knock up six pigs? And yes, not a problem, we'll get them done. Uh, what's the budget? And we'd tell her, and she'd sort of bulk, and then uh, moan at me for a little while, and then, hey presto, they'd be there. And the costumes were phenomenal, they made that series. She did a brilliant job. We did a programme where there was 40 people in chicken outfits, and 20 sumo wrestlers, and 10 people as dinosaurs. And you know, the, the lady had worked like, you know, 36 hours in a day. She'd had no sleep. Liz was such a perfectionist within her work, um, even to the finite detail. I mean, on the pigs, there were nipples. I mean, she really took everything to the finite detail um, and would never let anything come as the second best. It always had to be the best she could produce. And, and she was. I mean, she was a major talent. I had to wear all different costumes, wigs and things like that, and she always had to come up to me. And I know she had that little look on her face when she... I had to do something like wear a wig on for a gimmick or a gag or wear one of them chicken suits or whatever, but she was a fair and a nice lady, very, very warm. People would tear up and say, good God, I've got to wear that dinosaur outfit, I can't run in that. And Liz, I'm not joking, we spent hours changing the costumes, making sure they worked, so that people felt comfortable in it and had fun in it at the same time and remembered their day. Denise Allison runs a pub near Bristol. Three weeks ago, she confronted three men who'd broken into a car parked on her forecourt. I didn't think about what I was doing. I just went over and tackled them with no thought about what would happen, what the effects of it be or anything. I just did it. I said to him, you know, what is he playing at? And then he decided to spit in my face, which is what made me more angry than anything. It was the fact that he thought he could spit in and me not do nothing. So I proceeded to, right or wrong, go to hit him or grab him or whatever and that was when he realized that I wasn't I don't know a pushover or a meek and mild woman or whatever it was when he decided that he wasn't gonna stay around and, and hang around to see what was gonna happen next he decided to pull away with the car with my hand inside Denise was dragged along by the thieves car but somehow escaped with only a few bruises the parallels with Liz Sherlock's death are clear enough and it could quite easily have been me. I could quite easily have been in the situation that she was in. I think she did exactly what she thought she ought to do at the time when it happened. I mean, it was, I presume what was going through her mind at the time was, um, you know, he's just stolen my handbag and it's mine and not his. And she just did what she thought was right at the time. Over the last few days, I've heard her described as a fool, crazy to have gambled her life for the sake of a few pounds. Well, I suppose there are those of us who believe that we would react in the same way, in the same outrageous way, at that moment when something similar happens to us. Well, probably most of us wouldn't. So what caused her to lose her life? A moment of madness? Or was it something more fundamental, something to do with what's right and what's wrong? In the past year, and this is one statistic they can't contradict, there have been upwards of 2,000 muggins and robberies in and around the Euston area. But despite that, the man in charge of British Transport Police here insists that he is coping. There are policemen here now, as you'd expect after an incident. But the general criticism is that there aren't enough policemen. We don't see them around. And I think the police service is very live to that criticism. My job is to use the resources that are available to me as a police area commander and to make them as visible as possible and that's partly to do with putting them in the right place at the right time. But they weren't in the right place in the right time recently, were they? And that actually is a case that I know you're not expecting me to answer questions on. There were police officers uh, on duty at that time, uh, as there are here today. If I'm a mugger and I don't see a uniformed policeman here, that's not to say he's not here. We're going to be increasingly there. And if those muggers are watching here today, the British Transport Police and other police forces in London are looking to target criminals and be effective in the way we use our resources to catch them and put them before the courts. Whatever our Home Secretary says, whatever our police chiefs would have us believe, the sight of a bobby on the beat in this city is about as rare as a butterfly at Christmas. 
Whatever did happen to high-profile policing? Whatever did happen to that Bobby on the beat? How is it these crimes continue to flourish here when apparently the police know the names of addresses of so many of those people who commit them? Is it any wonder that so many of us have lost faith in the policeman's ability to protect us? And is it any wonder that Liz Sherlock decided to have a go and fight it out there alone? Liz was one in a million. And I think it's an awful reflection of our times. You know, this, the, this sort of thing should happen. I can't believe in this day and age uh, that this sort of crime could take place. You know, I think at the end of the day, I mean, I think we all want to fight for something that's ours. Michael Nicholson reporting. As you may have heard on News at 10, police arrested a man and a woman earlier today in connection with the incident in which Liz Sherlock lost her life. My From this? Kill and... Oh, 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 oh. Uh, to this. I look forward to it, standing in front of maybe 200 people. It's not a problem now, and I can't wait. You may remember the case of Craig Smith. He was one of four people with severe stammers whose cases we highlighted last year. All four signed up for expensive and controversial therapy in the desperate attempt to rid themselves of an affliction which had blighted their lives. During three days of intensive therapy, all four showed dramatic signs of improvement. But the question was, would it last? Six months on, we've been back to see all four. And Helen Wright has the latest on their remarkable stories. Um, <laughs> Carl Sharrix. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I just speak freely. Which is in um which is in um which is in um in in Finchley. It's an embarrassing condition shrouded in mystery. No one knows what causes it or what cures it. But for those who do stammer, it's debilitating and frustrating. Oh we go. How are you? In September, we followed four stammerers as they embarked on a crash course to help control their stammer. Um, um, I, and I was the only person in the school that um, I had to stammer. This is the story of what happened to them on that course and what's happened to them since. Well, I don't suppose you'd have heard it on radio then either. Craig Smith is a mechanic from Crewe. He met his girlfriend over the internet and his goal was to conquer his stammer so that one day he could say his wedding vows. We first met him in August and he was at a very low ebb. Last March, when I actually went into a pub, I made my girlfriend at the actual drinks. And the died just sat down and I just cried. Matt Beaver is 16. His ultimate ambition is to run his own hotel. But with such a severe stammer, his dreams were a fantasy. My hopes are uh, to speak and not, uh, not sort of per 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 not uh, sort of finally. Uh, but to speak um, enough, like on phones and um, and on to a people, I don't uh, know. Matt's mum's seen at first hand how her son's stammers held him back. He's had more hurdles to cross and he hasn't had the career choice of a lot of his friends. He has quite a problem with the telephone and he's quite clever. He avoids um, a long dialogue. He laughs or, um, and says yes or no and in a sort of um, friendly tone to make the other person probably carry their conversation on longer. Sally had read about the Maguire programme, a three-day course run by ex-stammerers, which promised to release sufferers like Matt from the straitjacket of stammering. She signed him up for the next course. The first task the new students have to perform is also the most painful, introducing themselves to the rest of the class. 
He has one of the most severe stammers on the course. My name is Matt Beaver. Hi, I'm going on. Uh, to hike, 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 college. My name is Craig Smith, and I've come all the way from Cheshire. My name, my name is um, my name is um, Lucy um, Sloyan. I work as a um. 25-year-old Lucy is trying to break into journalism, but interviewing people over the phone is a huge problem. When it actually oh, happens. People either um, laugh at me, which I think is um, and I was a nervous kind of, oh my God, how, how am I going to handle this? Um, they, um, they, can, um, they, they can sometimes um, hang up. But if that happens to you every single day, that is ever so hard. The students wear belts around their chests so they can feel their lungs expanding. Until they've mastered this method of breathing, they're not allowed to talk to each other or make calls home. The Maguire programme has its sceptics. Speech therapists who spend years treating stammerers find it hard to endorse. David Maguire is the man behind the company. He was once a severe stammerer himself. Stuttering is caused by the fear of stuttering. You see the same thing in tennis is called double faulting. Someone becomes so afraid of double faulting that they double fault. Same with this thing. Better not stutter, better not stutter. Well, what good is that going to do? That's going to make you stutter. And that's a big thing about this, too. Just stop seeing yourself as a client, as a patient in need of a cure, but as an athlete trying to get good as a sport. And that's what these people are trying to do. They're trying to get good at this sport of speaking. By the end of day one, the students have practiced their new breathing technique for over 10 hours. Being drilled in this way is an exhausting experience. Well, it's day two and the students have been here since 6am practicing their breathing as they prepare to do something that most of us just take for granted. They're going to try to say their names for the first time. Who's first? Lucy Sloyan. Matthew Beaver. Craig Smith. Um, I'm Carl Sharrix. Carl Sharrix. A winner makes no excuses. It's the last full day of the course and there's a real buzz of excitement in this class which is preparing the students for their ultimate challenge, public speaking in the city square this afternoon. is first up and immediately fear sets in. Which is in a... Which is in a... Which is in a... Which is in a... Is in a... 
which is in a... The wait is agonizing. After ages, I've now been able to actually say to say my own name, Lucy Sloyan. Although Lucy manages to say her name, it isn't without a struggle, and she leaves feeling the course hasn't worked for her. But for others, the endless drilling has paid off. This is one of my dreams, to stand up in front of you beautiful people. But I will have to go now and let someone else have a chance of their dreams. Hello? Hello? Uh, this is Matt here. How's it going, love? I got up onto a box. Yeah? In the middle of Durham city centre. Brilliant! And spoke to three to four minutes. Well done! And, and I didn't even stammer once. Oh, well done! Yeah, I, I think Dad's going to please. You sound so good! You sound brilliant! I know! I've never I spoke to her like that before. And as you could probably hear, she was really surprised and was laughing with really. it. That feels really good. My name is Craig Smith. This is the first time I've ever been able to say my own name. Every time I've tried to go into a chip shop, I've had to walk out because I can't even ask for fish, chips and curry. That's the yeah. first time in my life where I've had no fear. None at all. I am well on my way to recovery. I'd like to thank everybody on the course for all of their help. I just feel so happy now, I could cry. The Maguire programme claims to have a 70% success rate, but many people relapse once they leave the support group. After the break, we'll find out just how Carl, Matt, Craig and Lucy have coped since they left the course. The dramatic transformation of Matt, Craig and Carl was a story full of hope. People of Durham, <laughs> lend me your ears. <laughs> Others like Lucy left feeling like a failure. I am well on my way to recovery. The Maguire course is far from being a miracle cure and some experts believe it can have damaging consequences. One of the problems with the programme is that the focus is very much on the person who stammers. And for somebody who, who doesn't succeed, then that makes them feel dreadful because it, feels, because it makes them feel that it's all their fault. But for Matt, the course has led him to fulfil his dreams. I want to be a hotel manager. I'm a station waiter at the George. I basically uh, I take orders, I do drinks, I wait mainly, but I can now talk to the customers, which is amazing. If you told, to, if you told me that a year ago and said, you'll be in the George Hotel, you'll be taking orders, I would have laughed at you, I, totally. No way I would have done that. It's brilliant. And we want to keep this. Why am I keeping that? Uh, to put in the tomato sauce. Excellent. After I got back from the course, I just sat down with mum and I had a really long conversation, which I've never really had with mum. It's even things that I've been wanting to say for years. You've obviously got that, Matt. 
carry on and let's see it get finished. Thanks, Chef. I wanted this to work. I made sure this worked. This is this is my. I don't want to use the word last result, but it was, you know, this was the final thing. Uh, and basically I said it will work for me. If not, then I don't know what to do. Hello? Hello? Uh, this is Matt here. How's it going, love? Well, when I look back on the program and I see me doing the uh, phone call, it's a very emotional bit for me, personally, because it's the first time I spoke to my mum. I got up onto a box. Yeah? In the middle of Durham city centre. You sound so good. You sound brilliant. I know. Best ever. It was the first conversation we'd had in 16 three quarter years, so it's extremely emotional. As his mother, I knew the depth of him, but I don't think other people did. They didn't realise. It's like he's been a part of him's been unlocked. I, that's how I describe it. And now this character that was there can fully emerge and come through. Mm, I live with my. <laughs> I live with my girlfriend and, and Nicola. It was just a total nightmare. I've really only heard a few other people that has had a stammer as bad as what I had it. I just totally hated myself. During the course, Carl's transformation was dramatic. Three days ago, I couldn't even speak. One word. T-Nick. Yeah, Nicola was just so happy when I came on. Uh, she, she just burst into tears and so did really all of my family and everything. Um, just because they hadn't really heard me talk and just say like whole sentences without Stammering. Gaz, I've got as a, I've got as a bottle of tequila. But when the course finished, Carl found he quickly began stammering again. And you really need help most when you come home off a course, because that's when you start to waver. When you, when you're talking to fluent speaking people. That's when you tend to go back to your old tricks. Carl continued with his music career, but after a few weeks, he felt he had to return to the Maguire course to help him conquer his stammer all over again. Cheers, nice one, Pete. Uh, can we just come in and have a listen to that? Cheers, mate. You can't let yourself think of yourself as fluent. You've always got to... Think of you to think of yourself as a recovering stammerer. After a further relapse earlier this year, Carl went on a third Maguire course. It's very easy to relapse, and it's just part of the program. But we just have to let them know that well, this is just part of it, and you have to you relapse for a reason. You maybe you were trying to be too fluent too soon, and then the fear just got to you. I could not even say. My own name, which is Sylvester Scott, Craig Smith. Thank you very much. For Craig, the course has been very successful. It's easy to forget how he was before. Uh, I just think that people who can actually talk.